Lebanon's economic crisis is once again in the news. After banks were shut, following a number of attempts by account holders to withdraw their money by force. The country's economy has been facing a series of crises for years now, and even basic amenities such as the electricity network have collapsed. What are the reasons and symptoms of Lebanon's economic crisis? Rania Khalik of Breakthrough News explains. So Lebanon has been dealing with an economic collapse since late 2019, when it was revealed that the country was basically bankrupt because of a Ponzi scheme economy that had been totally acceptable and fine by the international community for the for the last 30 years leading up to this collapse. Uh, but for a number of reasons, both related to domestic local reasons, as well as international uh, uh you know, international policy from regional countries as well as the United States, 2019 is when it kind of all fell apart, right? And ever since then, Lebanon has been on this horrendous decline. It has yet to reach rock bottom, but every few months it seems to it seems to reach a sort of new bottom. And so recently, you know, you have seen a pushback from some with these attempted bank robberies, where you know the what's been taking place in Lebanon is the banks have placed these uh, these controls on people's ability to take their money out of the bank. So people have been limited into, in how much they can take out. So people's entire life savings that are still sitting in banks haven't been able to access more than like a few hundred dollars a month at most. And so people are becoming desperate because they have to pay for things. In some cases, they have to pay for certain medical treatments, um, for their kids' schooling, uh, just for like the basic things you need to survive that are going to be more than a few hundred dollars a month. So you had a few people uh, in the last couple of months basically go to banks and in some cases use toy guns, in some cases use real guns, and demand their deposits back. And some people were successful, others not so successful. Banks shut down for about a week as a result to beef up their security. So now it's much more difficult for anybody to actually do that. Um, but this is happening, of course, this is one of many crises taking place in Lebanon. There's also an ongoing issue over a maritime border dispute. There are gas fields off the Mediterranean that are partly in Lebanese waters, partly in what's considered Israeli waters. And as you know, the Israelis and the Lebanese are in a state of war. They do not negotiate or speak with each other. So there's been an American mediator who's been attempting to mediate, basically demarcating uh, the border in the sea so that both sides can start to exploit these gas resources. Mm -hmm. However, Israel has already sent ships to go and attempt and start drilling before the negotiations have concluded. And those ships had planned to drill in what is considered Lebanese waters. So there is a fear that there could be a war in late October, early November, if a negotiation or a deal isn't reached. However, right now, that actually looks quite positive. Both sides seem to be saying that they're going to agree on what has been proposed as of now, which is something that would be considered fair to both sides. Uh, and so we'll know by the end of October if that agreement does in fact go through. But of course, in the lead up to this, there's been a lot of controversy over the American mediator, this guy Amos Hochstein, who Joe Biden appointed, who is actually not only just American, he's also Israeli and actually served in the Israeli military when he was younger. Uh, so that has, of course, you know, uh, been something that the Lebanese were pretty irritated about. But regardless, you know, Hezbollah had stepped in at one point to basically threaten to go to war if Israel dares to drill in Lebanese waters before uh, an agreement is reached. And that actually did act as a measure of deterrence. The Israelis have not drilled. And it does look like the Israelis will agree to some sort of deal that the Lebanese can be OK with. Um, and so that's happening in the backdrop of this ongoing economic collapse in Lebanon. There's also, you've probably seen in the news, there's been headlines about migrants fleeing Lebanon uh, and dying in the Mediterranean, trying to get to Italy. Um, and I mean, this is something that's increased the number of people paying uh, these basically mafia bosses to get them on these boats that end up sinking. Uh, it's we We're used to, you know, in the last decade, having seen this with people in certain African countries, people from Libya, people from Syria, these very destabilized countries, destabilized oftentimes by wars um, 
aggravated by the United States. Uh, but in the case of Lebanon, this is something relatively new that's been taking place for the past year or so, where increasingly Lebanese, as well as Palestinians and Syrians who live inside Lebanon, let's remember Lebanon hosts many, many refugees from these countries, have been fleeing Lebanon, particularly people from the north, because the situation has just become so dire. Uh, there are, you know, Lebanon has become a country of really two classes, people who make dollars and people who make local currency. And because of hyperinflation, uh, because of the devaluation of the currency, the currency has lost so much of its value. Uh, people's salaries have become worthless. It's, and if you don't make dollars, it's become very difficult to live. Uh, I mean, your entire monthly salary might get you a couple of bags of bread and that's it. That's how bad it is for some people. So they feel they have no future and they're getting on these boats and risking death. And recently there was a boat that sank, I believe something like 93 or 94 people died. Many of them were Palestinian, Syrian, Lebanese fleeing Lebanon. So this is a relatively new phenomenon, really showing the desperation of people in Lebanon. And meanwhile, the international community is kind of just letting it happen. Um, a lot of this is political. You have countries like the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia especially, who would be happy. They hate Hezbollah. They see Lebanon as the home base for Hezbollah. As what they'll say in their media, they own a lot of the media in Lebanon. And oftentimes you'll see this framing of Lebanon is occupied by Iran. Um, and what they mean by that is that Hezbollah is, has a lot of power in Lebanon because they're democratically elected and also they're this like militant fighting group. And so a country like Saudi Arabia, which is an arm of American imperialism of the region and uh, has a lot of power in the region as a result of that, they have a very hawkish policy towards Lebanon and just want to see it burn. They feel if the Lebanese, if Lebanon just completely collapses or like, you know, uh, or just like, you know, is burnt down, then that'll actually decrease the power of Hezbollah. And so countries like Saudi Arabia are refusing to help, are pushing other Gulf state countries to refuse to aid Lebanon. So there's really no aid coming into Lebanon. And it's a country that has no sources of revenue because Lebanon's main economy used to be its banks, but its banks have collapsed. It doesn't produce anything. So that's why Lebanon is so desperate for this maritime border deal, because it will have actual resources, this gas, to exploit. And I mean, I just want to reemphasize that, again, this is happening as multiple crises take place. This economic collapse is literally collapsing every part of Lebanon, every sector. You have electricity cuts that last over 20 hours a day, forcing people to rely on these really unaffordable private generators that still don't give them 24-hour electricity. You have... A, a constant telecom outages. You've got a lot of the telecom companies. Um, people have been going on strike, and you know th that as a result, they're not able to maintain the equipment. And you know these are important things to make a country function. Um, and you have a lot of schools and universities in Lebanon starting to force students to pay tuition in dollars. Well, many students can't afford to pay tuition in dollars. So it's just on and on and on. Life for the majority, for most uh, people, the average person in Lebanon is becoming increasingly difficult. And that's why people want to leave. And it's really unfortunate because, you know, just a few years ago, Lebanon was considered this kind of island of stability in this increasingly chaotic region, just, you know, surrounded by war. Uh, and now it looks like it's Lebanon that's becoming the sort of source of, or a place of instability in the region. The economic crisis is intensifying, even as there's political uncertainty in the country. Elections were held in May, and Najib Mikati was chosen to form a government but the process continues to languish. What is the state of Lebanese politics and how is this affecting the country? Lebanon also has a government that has yet to be formed following elections earlier this year. And one of the uh, problems at the moment is they're trying to agree on a new president. The problem is nobody really agrees on who they want to be president. And also, you know, Lebanon isn't, it's, it is and isn't a sovereign country. When it comes to its own political formations inside, Oftentimes when it comes to picking a prime minister or picking a president or anybody in a position of that sort of like top level of power, there is a level of, in, uh, of, um, of opinion taken from outside power. So like it has to be somebody that the U.S. is satisfied with and that the Saudis are satisfied with. Um, and the Iranians don't really play so much of a role in uh, suggesting who, or sh who should or shouldn't be in power in Lebanon. So... It has to be something sort of like many different international players agree on. And right now, there is no agreement over that. Even Hezbollah and its ally, ML, aren't in agreement over who should be president. Even the so-called opposition 
uh, meaning a lot of the pro-U.S. Uh, political parties like like Lebanese forces and Kataib uh, and the future party, as well as the so-called independent parties, which are honestly really just like pro-Western parties at this point, uh, are in agreement over who the president should be. The president does need to be, I mean, one of the, you know, because Lebanon has a sectarian system, the president does need to be uh, a Maronite Christian. But aside from that, um, there's a lot of uh, contention over that right now. And from what I understand from people I've been speaking to, it's likely going to be something that is agreed to after the maritime deal is negotiated. So I feel it seems as though a lot of the sort of political de deadlock in Lebanon is going to remain deadlocked at least until the end of October, early November, when hopefully an agreement is reached with the Israelis over the border demarcation, because people are also waiting to see who gets to take credit for that? People, you know, if it works out, every party is going to come forward and try to take credit for it. And if it doesn't work out, you don't want to be the party who's been kind of pretending to be like, oh, I'm in charge of these negotiations. So various political players are just kind of waiting it out to see where the political winds are and how these negotiations go to see how they want to move forward.